Okay, thank you very much, uh, David and Axel, ladies and gentlemen. Um, if we can, uh, so, uh, before starting and looking at the data, just uh, three remarks. This is a debate where, of course, everybody takes a bit more extreme positions. Um, second remark is I was involved in both trials as well, the regraphic test test. And the third is not a remark, but a question to the two chairs. Um, independent question that before I do my, my talk, um, in which journal do you prefer to publish your research? Lancet or New England? Um, and which do you rate the highest, Axel? Oh, uh, probably Cell, Nature, and Science. No, no, between uh, these two, <laughs> clinical journals, Lancet well, since, or New England. Since Don't I'm, go around the uh, question. Since right? I'm European, I would say Lancet, of course. Okay. <laughs> New England journal. Okay. I guess this will give the answer uh, in the debate here um, uh, in this situation. But just looking at the data um, in this situation, um, I will discuss TAS, um, one of the new agents um, and that we do have, and, and the armamentarium is increasing, of course, in colorectal cancer. And um, earlier we saw an older ESMO guidelines, but there are newer guidelines, um, Alan, that have been simplified, um, the ESMO guidelines. If you look in the more recent literature um, uh, that we published in the Annals of Oncology, and we have to see the different uh, drugs, uh, regorafenib and TAS-102, in this setting, in the continuum of care, and in the guidelines um, in this. Um, of course, in the guidelines, as you could see on the previous slide, uh, today, um, regorafenib um, is in it. TAS-102 is not yet in the guidelines. It's not yet approved um, um, in, in different parts of the world, um, at least in the Western world. What is TAS-102? Just uh, two or three slides. TAS-102 is a combination of um, TPI, tiparacyl hydrochloride, it's a timidine phosphorylase inhibitor that prevents a degradation of FTD. FTD is trifluoridine, is the other component. Uh, and that's a nucleoside which is incorporated in, um, into DNA in tumor cells after phosphorylation. And here you see a schematic representation of the mechanism of action. TAS-102 is just not 5-FU, it has clear differences. Um, it is the combination, as I said, of FTD and TPI. TPI preventing the degradation, as you can see on the left. Um, and FTD, which is then incorporated uh, into DNA and then causing DNA dysfunction and inhibition of tumor growth. And this final slide on the mechanism of action shows some of the differences between TAS-102 and 5-FU. 5-FU, which is a TS, delayed synthase inhibitor, and inhibiting DNA duplication. And TAS-102, uh, which is incorporated um, into DNA and causing DNA damage, um, as, as mentioned earlier on. If you look in the clinical trials, it's always good that we can show two different clinical trials. And indeed, there are two different clinical trials, as with uh, regorafenib, where, uh, where Axel also highlighted two different clinical trials. The story started in Asia, in Japan, with this randomized phase two study, which was published in the Lancet Oncology. Um, um, uh, that was a monotherapy uh, trial of TAS-102 plus best supportive care versus best supportive care plus placebo, uh, two to one randomization, uh, just over 150 patients, uh, chemorefractory patients um, um, being defined as uh, refractory or intolerant to uh, fluoropyrimidines, arenetican, and doxaliplatin. Uh, straightforward, there were no clear inclusion criteria on the biologicals in this uh, study. But the primary endpoint in this randomized phase two study was overall survival. And as you can see, RNS was published in the, um, in the Lancet Oncology. Um, TAS-102 improved the overall survival uh, with a very nice hazard ratio, uh, hazard ratio of 0.56. Uh, Japanese patients, relatively small uh, sample size in this, uh, in this setting. Um, and as you can see also for progression-free survival, a uh, uh, clear benefit also with a hazard ratio of 0.41 uh, in, this, um, in this phase two study. After that, we did a, a phase three study and Axel has shown already some of the data because of course they were extremely nice. He could not give a talk without showing these data um, in, this, uh, in this situation. The RECORS study, as Axel already pointed out, um, uh, best supportive care plus placebo or TAS-102, two to one randomization, um, 
um, uh, 534 patients in the TAS-102 arm, 266 in the uh, placebo arm. Um, and patients um, were refractory or intolerant to fluoropyrimidines, iron and oxaliplatin, bevacizumab, and in the Keras wild type patients also to an anti gvar antibody being cetuximab or panitimab. Um, the other criteria were quite standard and as was said already, quite similar to the data and to the, to the design of the correct study. Uh, the primary endpoint was overall survival. Um, just a couple of slides on the demographics, uh, just to show that, it's, that it's, there were no surprises, no imbalances uh, regarding the different clinical parameters. Um, important to stress here was that this study was a global study. Uh, around half of the patients came from Europe, um, one third from um, Japan, and then uh, between 10 and 15 percent of the patients came from the US. So it was a global uh, study uh, take, uh, that was taken on and that was uh, done in this, um, in, uh, for this drug. Uh, in contrast to the earlier phase two study that I've shown you, uh, which was a Japanese study um, in this situation. Some other um, patient characteristics and disease characteristics uh, were really not different, such as uh, KRAS mutation status, the primary location of the tumor, the number of prior regimens, uh, the time since diagnosis of metastasis, which is a prognostic uh, parameter, um, and then looking also at the prior treatments, uh, you can see. And important here is to stress on the bottom uh, is that a um, similar number of patients received prior regorafenib before going on the TAS-102 trial, and this was 17 and 20 percent, as you can see uh, on the bottom of the slide. So no difference uh, in this situation, neither. Looking at the overall survival um, in, in this, um, this TAS-102 phase three study, um, and by the way, these data, and that's why I posed that question um, earlier on, are now um, accepted for publication in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, um, and will, will be published in the near future. Um, TAS-102 um, improved the survival. Um, hazard ratio of 0.68, so a very nice hazard ratio. If we as clinicians um, are in the discussion phase of setting up a trial um, and we are asked what would you like to see, we always say we don't like hazard ratios for survival starting with a 0.8. We are hesitating. We accept often a 0.7, but if we see something below 0.7, we are always uh, enthusiastic. And that's what happened here, um, as you can see, and a median difference of um, 1.8 months going up from 5.3 uh, to 7.1 months. Uh, and looking, for instance, at, two, at one year survival points, um, 18% versus 27% uh, in the study. Looking at some subgroups, um, I will be fast on that. Uh, some of the clinical subgroups that you can see here, including uh, KRAS mutation state, is also uh, uh, the benefit was consistent in the different subgroups in favor of TAS-102 um, uh, for these different parameters that you can see here um, um, on this slide, um, um, as well as here for ECOG performance status, tumor localization, prior treatment. Uh, and also on the bottom here, again, um, Prior use of regorafenib, uh, almost 20%, as I said, um, of patients. Uh, but the benefit was similar whether patients were previously treated with regorafenib or not. The hazard ratio was identical, 0.69, um, in both subgroups uh, in, this, um, in, in this analysis uh, for overall uh, survival. Progression-free survival, you've seen similar curves. You've seen similar curves a uh, long time ago with, uh, with cetuximab. Um, in the, in the uh, KRAS wild type patients, you've seen a similar curve um, with regorafenib that Axel showed. Uh, this uh, hazard ratio here is very similar, 0.48. Uh, and you can see the difference uh, in the curve separating often after um, the first evaluation point um, when the first scan is done in the patients. And also, again, uh, the forest plots for PFS. Um, I will not go in detail. I just want to draw uh, in view of the debate also here on the bottom of the slide um, your attention uh, to the fact prior use of regorafenib, um, uh, the hazard ratio for PFS was similar whether patients were pretreated or uh, not pretreated with regorafenib 0.53 and 0.47 uh, uh, respectively, as you can see um, in this situation. 
A major discriminator here is the tolerance pattern. Um, and um, these are, of course, not data of test 102 versus regorafenib. Um, and we will learn, of course, more with regorafenib. And also, Axel pointed out some of the important aspects, uh, such as optimizing the dose. Uh, but looking here at the data of um, test 102, um, looking at the non-hematological adverse events, uh, you can see uh, in yellow for test 102, in white for placebo. If you look at the grade three and four lines, um, so the severe uh, grade three and four adverse events, really there is nothing that is pointing out. It's all single digit. Uh, it's much below 10%. Uh, uh, it's even below 5%. And there are really no differences between uh, test 102 and placebo. And asking to the investigators who were involved in this study, it's not looking at the hematology, at the white blood cell count. It was really impossible to differentiate toxicity-wise uh, on which drug patients were on uh, placebo or TAS-102. Um, looking at, there is of course some toxicity, and looking at some hematological uh, toxicities, uh, neutropenia was the most frequent grade three and four, uh, and you can see that 37% of patients at the grade three or four uh, neutropenia. Uh, Few patients um, had uh, thrombocytopenia grade three and four, and there were some patients with anemia um, in, this, uh, in this situation. But the grade three and four neutropenia led very rarely to uh, neutropenic um, infections uh, um, in, the, in this situation. So the impact is limited. Uh, on top of that, no liver toxicity, no renal toxicity, as you can see here. And here you see the numbers of febrile neutropenia um, grade three and four combined was 3.7% um, um, with TAS-102. Um, and you see some other uh, highlighted again. hand foot syndrome, which we see with other fluoroprimidines, uh, was not seen here with TAS-102. Um, cardiac ischemic events, uh, grade three and four, uh, not seen. Uh, Thromboembolic events, uh, not, uh, not seen uh, uh, with, with this or not at an excess rate seen uh, um, here in this uh, trial. We didn't collect quality of life because of different reasons, but we looked at time to uh, eco performance status, deterioration. Uh, as you've seen, uh, patients at the start had an eco performance status zero or one um, in the study. This is a deterioration to a PS2 or more. You can see that it took longer uh, for patients on test 102 compared to patients on placebo until deterioration of their performance status on top of prolonging survival, which is important. So they live longer and they live, uh, they, it seems that they maintain uh, their performance status also for a longer time in this situation. So that are the data, we can debate more on that, of course, we will debate more on that. Uh, but are, that are the data, TAS-102 is an active drug um, in this situation, improving overall survival and progression-free survival. We have two trials, a randomized phase three, published soon in the New England, um, and a randomized phase two published in the Lancet Oncology um, um, from Japan. Um, limited toxicity um, was uh, and a very uh, good tolerance uh, and, uh, and also a significant prolongation of time to eco performance uh, status two was, uh, was observed uh, in this situation. Thank you. Thank you.